Well, good morning and welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, a few things this morning, as we do every Sunday morning, encourage you, if you're sitting on the inner aisles there, if you take the fellowship pad and sign in. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, note that there's a prayer request card in there. Uh, you know, we take prayer very seriously here, and it's something that we want to, to do for one another. So if you have any prayer requests, whether it's for you, family members, friends, uh, please let us know either from the cards or email us or drop by the church office sometime. We'd be happy to, to pray for you. And also anyone joining us online, we welcome you and would uh, uh, love to pray for you as well if you, if you are in need of prayer. Uh, we had a really uh, great Sunday last Sunday, not only in worship, but right after worship, we had a new member meeting, and we had 11 people join the church last Sunday, so that's pretty awesome, <laughs> which segues into today's announcement, and that is we're having our new member reception, and so if you see folks wearing these yellow uh, ribbons, so they've joined sometime within the last few months, and so we're going to have cake and refreshments and stuff over here from the, the kitchen area. So we invite you to, after the service, you know, don't jump out earlier, but after the service, go get you some cake, get some refreshments, find someone with a yellow tag and welcome them, greet them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a way to connect better as a church family. So we hope you'll stick around for that. Uh, also coming up, there's a number of children's ministry items uh, as we lead up to uh, Palm Sunday and Easter. Uh, they're doing a Journey to the Cross event this year. This is something new for the kiddos. And then also, as they do every year, the, the Easter egg hunt. And uh, so those are upcoming. And uh, youth, as far as uh, what we're doing, we're going to meet tonight for youth group. But then spring break starts. So we're going to take a, a week off. And then when we come back from spring break or that last Sunday of spring break, we're not going to meet at the church, just so everyone knows. We're going to meet at uh, Willow Fork Park, and we're going to play some disc golf and have some sandwiches and picnic out there. So that, that'll be uh, fun. If you have any questions on that, please let us know. Uh, I've got an update on our, our trip to Greece for those that are interested in this tour. I tried to email those that I'd, you know, I'd heard from that were interested. If you didn't get an email on the update, uh, please let me know. But... Um, We've decided to, to drop the price down and not include the flights, have those do on your own because it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be kind of just better overall for everyone. And uh, we do have a travel agent though that's willing to, to book those flights for you if you don't want to mess with it uh, and she does that at no extra cost. So we, we have a pre-trip meeting coming up on March the 17th, Sunday, right after worship. And so if you're interested in the trip at all, if you just have questions, if you just want to hear more, um, I encourage you to attend that meeting here in a couple weeks after service. And if you have any questions that you want to go ahead and send us ahead of time to make sure you have answered, you're welcome to, that, to do that as well. But uh, brochures, updated brochures are out in the foyer. Um, also coming up, we have obviously Palm Sunday, March 24th. But then later that week, we'll have our Monday Thursday service here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. Uh, it's a service where we remember, we celebrate the, the Lord's Supper and Jesus being in the upper room with his disciples before his, his journey to the cross. And so we hope you can join us for that meaningful service. And then Easter Sunday uh, coming up, the last Sunday of March, March 31st. We will have uh, two services, one at 7 a.m. We usually meet right over here. Uh, it's an outdoor service, weather permitting. So that means uh, I encourage you to bring your, your fold-out chairs if you want to attend that service. And uh, if, if that's not your thing, we will still have the 1030 service here in the sanctuary. So Easter Sunday, March 31st. And last announcement I have, and I don't know what I did my, with my flyer, but if you want to purchase Easter flowers uh, for the sanctuary for that day and then to take home with you, there's uh, forms in the foyer for that as well. Um, and if you have any questions on anything coming up, please, please, please let us know. We'd be happy to, to answer any questions you have. Well, before we begin with our call to worship, let's stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ.
right, if you will please remain standing with me as we join in our call to worship found either in your bulletin or on the screens above. And our call to worship comes from Psalm 86. Teach us your way, O Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Give us an undivided heart to revere your name. We give thanks to you, O Lord our God, with our whole heart, and we will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward us. You have delivered our souls from the depths of Sheol. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn your hearts to the Lord and let us praise the Lord for all his marvelous works. Let us worship God. seated and kiddos want to join me at the front for our children's lesson just be careful with the tables all right y'all come on forward all right do y'all know what next week is spring break. spring break can you believe it's already here or almost here you still got to do one more week of school if you're in school and then you get spring break so i hope you're excited it's just around the corner you can make it you can do it all right, well, I've got something here. What is in this bag? Bread. Bread. Yeah, y'all didn't seem too excited about that. 
All right. Got some bread. And it's not even a full loaf. This is, this is all we had at home. We have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five slices of bread. Now, do you think these five slices of bread could feed everyone here today? Yes. You think so? Okay. Maybe if we made them really small pieces. Crumbs, Crumbs maybe. Well, yeah, so, but it's not going to fill anyone up. It's not going to, like, quench their hunger or anything like that. Yeah, there's only so far five, slice, five little slices of bread can go. Well, there's a story, there's actually a couple stories in the Bible of Jesus feeding a multitude of people, thousands of people, and he does it with only a few loaves of bread and a few fish. It's something that uh, Jesus miraculously does. And the lesson for us in that You know, sometimes we look at our lives and we're like, you know, we're not that big. Sometimes we can't, we don't feel like we can do a whole lot. But we have to understand and remember that God can do a lot more than we can imagine. And just like Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish, God can take what we have, even the small little things that we have. And when we serve God with faith and with love, God can do even bigger things for his kingdom. Will you all pray with me? God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that you care for us. Lord, that you sustain us, that you uphold us. We ask that you would just give us courage. Uh, Lord, let us know your love as we share the message of the gospel and of your hope with those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all be careful. (laughs) All right, as they're making their way to Faith Express... We'll join now in our unison prayer of praise and confession, also found either in your bulletin or it'll be on the screens above. As God's church with one voice, let us pray. Holy God, you are righteous and good in all your ways. By your grace, you have made us your covenant people, marked us as your own, and charged us for lives of service. Yet we live as if worldly success were the worthiest aim. We elevate independence as the highest virtue. Forgive us when we do not put our trust in you. Forgive us when we put our success over serving your kingdom. Forgive us, O God, and wash us in your mercy. Let's take a few moments in silence for personal prayers of confession. God, you are merciful and gracious, compassionate toward the humble, and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, we confess our sin to you, trusting that your promise of forgiveness is sure. Grant us the desire to turn from sin, to turn from selfishness, to turn from our unbelief, and to trust in you in the power of the cross. Give us hearts of compassion that we would forgive as you have forgiven us. And call us once more to take up our crosses and show us how to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy out of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith in Christ. Friends, this is a gift of God. Let's stand and sing our praise to God.
please be seated. Well, since the first Sunday of January, as we began the new year, we've been working our way through the gospel according to St. Mark. And if you count the Ash Wednesday service, today marks the 10th lesson in this gospel account. And so far, Jesus has been teaching and healing and carrying out his ministry, mostly around the, the vicinity, the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And last Sunday, we looked at the passage where the scribes and the Pharisees questioned Jesus. Why were his disciples eating without first washing their hands? And since that passage, where we left off last week, Mark then goes on with his account to tell us that Jesus traveled to Tyre and Sidon, which um, are on the Mediterranean coast. It's about 40, 50 miles away from the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus travels there. And then he travels back toward the Sea of Galilee. And he's in the region of the Decapolis, which if you remember this, this is where Jesus encountered who I kind of termed as the caveman, the man who was possessed by the legion of demons and uh, who lived among the tombs, the caves. And the Decapolis is, uh, it's not a specific town, rather it referred to an area, a region, which encompassed ten cities. That's what the, the word means. There's deca. That's the the Greek word meaning ten, and polis, that's the word meaning city. And so there's this region of ten cities, so we don't know exactly where Jesus is within this region, but it appears that he's still somewhere within this area, and that's where we're going to pick up in today's narrative and Mark chapter 8. But before we read, let us pray. Holy Spirit, we pray, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to understand and hearts to treasure your word have compassion on us for we are sheep in need of the great shepherd may we hear the voice of christ and follow him trusting in his protection lord we pray feed us and nourish us with your word this morning and strengthen us for the journey ahead we pray this in jesus name amen Mark chapter 8, I'm going to start with reading, uh, by reading verses 1 through 10. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and when they had nothing to eat, he, being Jesus, called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them, and they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went into uh, the district of Dalmanutha, Dalman, let me get this, Dalmanutha, Dalmanutha. Well, if you were here two Sundays ago, you may have been listening to the beginning of today's text thinking, this sounds oddly familiar. Like, haven't we already covered this? And, well, the answer is, no, we haven't covered this passage yet. In Mark's gospel account, he, he records two events where Jesus miraculously feeds a multitude. Back in Mark chapter 6 and here in Mark 8. And I'm not going to preach the same sermon I did uh, from two weeks ago. But last time, I focused on how Jesus feeds our hungry hearts. And I talked about of our need for spiritual retreat and spiritual nourishment. And there were other things about the passage that I didn't cover that day because I was purposefully saving them for today. Because there's a connection between these two stories, as we will see. And so I thought today we would start by briefly looking at the similarities and the differences between these two accounts. So the similarities. So both of these accounts involve a large crowd of people being with Jesus. 
Both accounts occur in a desolate place. They're away from, from towns. They're not within a city where food's nearby. They're out in the countryside. They're, they're out by themselves. They also both say that Jesus had compassion on the crowd, which was his, his motivation for, for feeding them. They both have Jesus asking his disciples about how, how, much, how many loaves of bread they have, how many fish did they have on hand. Both of these passages also indicate that the disciples were perplexed. You know, how could just what little we have feed all these people? There's also similarities in that both describe Jesus, yes, miraculously feeding the people. And so much so that there was even food left over after everyone had been fed. So, a lot of similarities. What about the differences? And and really the differences lie in the details. Because as we'll see, kind of the the message of the stories are similar. But the differences that we see is in Mark chapter 6, the crowd was with Jesus for a day. In Mark chapter 8... The crowd was with Jesus for three days. In Mark 6, they gathered together five loaves of bread and two fish. In Mark chapter 8, they gathered seven loaves and a few small fish. There's actually a different Greek word used for the word fish here. They're they're kind of more of like a, maybe not a minnow. What's bigger than a minnow? Like a sardine or something like that, a small fish. Also in Mark chapter 6, there were 12 baskets full of leftovers. And in Mark chapter 8, there's 7 baskets full of leftovers. So that's a difference. And lastly, in Mark 6, it says that Jesus fed 5,000 men, not including the women and children. So that number being even larger than 5,000. Whereas in Mark chapter 8, it says that he fed about 4,000 people total. Now, I'm sure you could dig further on into the the nitty-gritty little details, but I don't think that's really the, the message isn't so much in the details there. And it's really the details, though, as we look at the passage, that's what the disciples were worried about. They were concerned with the details. Let's look back at Mark chapter 6, and this is from uh, verse 35 to 37 at what it says there. It says, when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. You know, the disciples were thinking very practically. It's getting late. These people are going to be hungry. We don't have food here. We're in a desolate place. They need to go find food, right? You know, but Jesus answered them saying, you give them something to eat. And then they responded to Jesus, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Now, in case you don't have that exchange rate in your head, you know, what is 200 denarii worth? So that was for a, for a you know, general laborer in this time. It was about seven to eight months worth of wages. It was no small amount of money. And so the disciples are saying, Jesus, look, there's a lot of people here. Some might even say about 5,000 or more people here. And even if we wanted to, even if we wanted to feed them, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. Much less there's not even even food around. We just can't do it. We can't afford it. We need to dismiss them so that they can go find food for themselves. You can't fault their thinking, right? Like it's, it's a logical thought process. It would take something extraordinary, something miraculous for these people to be fed which is what Jesus did. Now, something that I was going to try to get to in my sermon a couple weeks ago, I just didn't have time to, was what happened right after Jesus fed the 5,000. So still in in Mark chapter 6. After Jesus had fed the 5,000, he had his disciples get into the boat and, and head out on the Sea of Galilee without him. He stayed back. And then during the night, it's the account where Jesus walks on the water. He walks out to the disciples in the boat. And, you know, it's another miraculous event. And I wanted to to focus on this because there's an interesting detail in, in, in this passage. So it says, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. And then listen to to this line here that it adds. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So somehow their astonishment of Jesus walking on water was not just about 
him walking on the water. It had something to do with them not understanding about the loaves. Back to Jesus feeding the 5,000. There was some, something that they were missing from that that they should have known. So fast forwarding two chapters to our passage today in Mark 8. And, and we don't know how much time has passed. But again, Jesus and the disciples are with a crowd of thousands. And Jesus wants the disciples to help him feed the crowd. And the disciples are, they're, they're again, they're thinking about the details. His disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread, with bread here in this desolate place? You know, Jesus, there is nothing around here where we can get food for all these people. Now we read this and you, know, you might think, well, guys, you already like literally just saw Jesus do this before. You know, why are you doubting at all at this point? But they are. And again, Jesus had them count up what little they did have. They miraculously fed the 4,000 and still there were leftovers. Now I want us to look at the, the rest of our passage today and then we'll, we'll come back and, and talk more about it. So there's a, there's a scene change. After Jesus feeds the 4,000, there's a little bit of a scene change. And it picks up in verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread. And they only had one loaf with them in the boat. Right? So remember, Jesus had just fed the 4,000. And he has this little run-in with the Pharisees. And he gets back in the boat with the disciples. And they realize they forgot to bring the leftovers with them. They only had one. Has anybody, like, you know, you, gone, you go to a restaurant, you get your to-go box, and you leave it on the table when you leave the restaurant? I, I've done that more than I care to admit. But they, so they're in the boat. And, you know, I, I wonder which disciple, you know, put two and two together and looked down. I was like, oh, man, we left all the good stuff. There's only one loaf here. There's 13 of us. This isn't going to work. Well, let's continue in the passage, and then we'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, picking up now at verse 15. And Jesus cautioned them, saying, Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Do you understand? Again, remember back to Mark 6. Again, after Jesus fed the 5,000, after he walked on water, it said that the disciples did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And now here in Mark 8, after Jesus fed the 4,000, and after the Pharisees had harassed him, Jesus is back in the boat again with his disciples, asking them about the loaves, saying, Do you not yet understand? What are they supposed to understand? What is the bigger message that they are missing that Jesus keeps pointing them back toward? Obviously, there's something more Jesus wanted them to know. And it had to do with this, this, these loaves of bread. I think that what they didn't understand yet, maybe they understood it kind of cognitively, but they didn't really understand it in their hearts yet, was their need to trust in Jesus' divine authority. It was like they had eyes, but still could not yet truly see who Jesus really was. And what Jesus was doing and what Jesus could do. They were still seemingly holding on to a self-reliance of the things that they could control, of the things that, that, that you know, that what they were focused on what they could do and what they could not do. They were, not, they were operate, operating with a, a sense of doubt, a sense of unbelief. And here they were in a boat, 
worried because they only had one loaf of bread for 13 of them. When before their eyes, Jesus had just fed 5,000. Before their eyes, Jesus had fed 4,000. Both times with only just a few loaves of bread and a few little fish and even leftovers. But in those accounts, Jesus had been so, or I'm sorry, in those accounts, the disciples had been so focused on the details. They'd been so focused on the deep details of the things they couldn't do. They were in a desolate place. They didn't have resources. There were too many people. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have enough money to buy food. They were focused on what they couldn't do. And often like the disciples, we too sometimes focus on the details and the things that we think can't be done. You know, for us as individuals, we may think, you know, what could little old me possibly do? I can't really make that much of a difference. What can I give, you know, or what I can give doesn't really amount to a whole lot. I don't have enough that make a real impact. Or maybe it's, you know, I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't know enough about theology to talk to someone about faith. Or I don't think this person will even listen to me or care what I have to say about faith, so I just better not really say anything at all. And even as a, as a church, we may think, you know, we're not a large mega church. We can't really do that much. We're limited on what we can do. We don't have enough in our budget for this or that and the other. We can't reach people because we can't compete with all the other things that are happening and, and the things that are seemingly driving our society these days. You know, we can insert a lot of things in here. We can insert a lot of excuses in here about how we're too small. But the problem is our perspective is too small and it's self-focused. But friends, the gospel shows us that it is amazing what Jesus can do with even just a little bit of faith. Doesn't Jesus say in Matthew 17, 20, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. The, G the disciples didn't yet understand what was possible if they fully trusted what Jesus could do. And Jesus used people like the disciples. They weren't high people up on pedestals. They were, they were common fishermen, tax collectors. They were ordinary average Joes. But he called them to partner with them for the work of building the kingdom of God. If you think about these stories of the feeding the crowds, something that both of these stories have in common is that Jesus took what little the disciples had to give him and he gave it back to them. And it was their job to go and share it with the crowd. Jesus didn't just take from them and just kind of magically, you know, throw the food out there to the crowd. He had the disciples take it back from him and go and serve the crowd. They were doing ministry. They were acting as Jesus' hands and feet. That's what Jesus wants us to do. We give to Jesus, you know, what little we have or what we think is so little. And it may not equate to, to bread in this example or money. It may be our time. It may be our actions. It may be our words or just our life. And when we give those things to Jesus, even those little things, we have to wonder what Jesus can do with that. When we become Jesus' hands and feet, when we love and serve our neighbor, when we do the ministry that Jesus has called us to do, we are serving to build up the kingdom of God. You know, most of the time it's not about having a big, elaborate, fancy banquet to feed the multitude. Most of the time, God calls us to work through the ordinary. When we focus on serving people one piece of bread at a time, one person at a time. And when we are all working toward that mission that Christ has called us to, it can make a kingdom impact. Jesus calls us to help build up the kingdom of God. I think I've shared this before, but I can honestly say that my life was changed by a 13-year-old kid. 
And later, my life was changed by a 16-year-old kid. They're not 13 and 16 now. They're older. But when I was in junior high, my life was changed by a friend of mine inviting me to church. Changed the rest of my life. I didn't know it then, obviously. But I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be in this church today if it weren't for that 13-year-old kid. I wouldn't be in church today if it weren't for my 16-year-old friend that invited me to church after we had moved to Arlington. I didn't have, a, had, I didn't have any friends there. He invited me to church. I went. I found community. I grew in my faith. Little things. Little things that we can do that can have a monumental impact in someone's life and in the kingdom of God. Friends, we need to trust what Jesus can do. It's not about what we can do on our own. It's about what God can do through us. And we are called to trust. And we are called to serve. And we are called to love. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your grace and the many ways in which you work in our lives and through our lives. Lord, we don't often know the, the outcome of our actions and the, and the seeds that we plant. Lord, we may plant a seed, someone else may water it, but ultimately we know and we trust that it's you that makes it grow. Lord, help us to see that even small things that we do, Lord, when we do them in faith, Lord, that you can multiply and build up the kingdom of God. So give us strength to walk in obedience. Give us boldness to walk in faith. Lord, give us a vision and guide us. Lord, put opportunities before us where we can love and serve and share the good news that we have and the hope that we have in you. Lord, as a church family, we know that you call us to pray for one another. Lord, and that's important to us. And so we pray for those in need of prayer. We pray for the family of George Quigg and the family of David Schaefer as they mourn loss. We pray for Dick Heedner and Jim and Sandy Lee Hamilton and Claren McCoy. We pray for Corey Widger, for Don and Mina Farmer, for the Killingsworth family, for Gail Marlin, for Ginger Hopkin and Chris Shu, for Sarah Priest's father, Samuel, for the Swerk family. Lord, we lift up to you others that may be on our minds and hearts. Lord, give us opportunities to love and serve and encourage one another as we seek to walk in obedience to your will. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our next hymn.
please be seated. Let's continue in worship with the giving of our offering.
I think there's kind of a neat parallel between Jesus feeding the multitude with the loaves of bread and what we do here at this table. Friends, do we understand about the loaves? Do we understand what this means? This is indeed wondrous bread because it reminds us of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. It reminds us of our forgiveness for sin. It reminds us that Jesus is with us as we take this sacrament together. And as we leave through these doors, Jesus is with us. Will you all pray with me? God, we thank you for this time. Lord, this invitation to this table. Lord, this table represents an invitation for all to come, all who put their trust in you. Lord, just as you called your disciples to trust in you, empower us to trust in you, to be nourished by you and strengthened by you. Lord, fill our spirits. Lord, that we would be made whole. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's something else about this bread. You know, we call this time communion, or it's called a number of things, but one of the things we call it is a joyful feast. We may look at this one piece of bread saying, that doesn't look like a feast. Just like the disciples looked at those loaves of bread and the fish saying, I don't think this is going to feed everyone. But this isn't just about feeding our congregation here. Communion represents something much bigger than that. Because we are united with Christians all across the globe, think about the many loaves of bread that are broken this day, this year. Think about the loaves of bread that have been broken for the past 2,000 years. And here's the mind-blowing one, all the loaves of bread that will be broken into eternity future as we come to the Lord's table. Friends, on the night before Jesus died, he took bread And after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, all of you. This is my body which has been broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant which was sealed with my blood, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim Jesus' death until he comes again. I'm going to ask our elder Margo to come forward with me. Uh, as we have done for a couple years now, if you'll come forward, the ushers will, will guide you forward. Uh, take a bread and cup and take it with you to your seat and hold it. And then when all have been served, we'll, we'll partake together. If you'd like to be served from your seat, Dan is going, going to be going around with a tray. So just flag him down and he'll serve you at your seat. All is ready.
body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let's stand together as we sing the Lord's Prayer. to nourish ourselves with daily bread. Today, after the service, we've got some cake over there, too, so I hope you'll <laughs> stick around and uh, greet those, especially that have a yellow ribbon uh, on their clothes there, on their uh, name tag, that's what I was thinking of, and uh, make them feel welcome. Introduce yourself and just share words of encouragement as you have some cake and refreshments. Friends, sometimes we focus so much on the things that we feel like we can't do. On the things that we feel like, you know, this isn't going to make much of a difference. But maybe we consider a bigger perspective and consider what Jesus can do through us. And that's not to build up our own kingdom. It's to serve the kingdom of God. And that's what we're called to do each and every day. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and all your days. Go in peace. Amen.